Thrones. Let's do it. All right, started. In a world. <laughs> I have to, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> if we actually had the other part of the, the, the introduction. <laughs> uh, so here, I've got some notes uh, that I've revisited. These are uh, ideas and principles that I've... Uh, I've, I've learned years ago, but, like, there's a difference between, like, learning, knowing, and, you know, un- understanding a thing. And so, for the last couple of years, uh, I've gone through this very passive regimen of observing all of these things, and how they, uh, how they dwell and shape uh, the universe in and around us, and I mean, luckily, uh, they're they're out there to explore. Uh, it's just you gotta have the right lens to uh, uh, fixate the validity of the the teaching to uh, to every area of life and their uh, their hermetic principles. But um, you know. I don't really like where it comes from or where people think it comes from. Uh, there's, it gets its name from, uh, Hermes, uh, Trismegistus, the thrice great. And I don't, I don't really dig that for the sheer sake of like, well, you know, what's so great about that in the first place? Who set that standard? Yeah, it's very, very potent and valid information, but, uh, there's a little bit of bias on that behalf, so I try not to subscribe to the the bias behind the intention, but the uh, intention behind the teaching, and that to me has proven to be more than valid. Um, if anybody's read like the Kabbalion and uh, all these like super double secret ancient texts that are readily available online. Uh, it's, it's there, you know, and a lot of the principles that are present there, all in one place, um, they predate most of the organized theology that pervades the planet now. So you see... Or you see a, uh, a religion... Repeat that last part. What of it is valid? Repeat that last part. Yeah, uh, it's you, like the internet cable up. Yeah, it's. I think it's mine. Uh, the these principles uh, can be found all in one place if you're looking in the right place, but you can see them in everything. Most. Religions and theologies take and kind of pick and choose and uh, write over them, and you're really forced to read and reread these stories, these uh, these myths and legends of holy men that really do everything but address it directly. And with that, you know, we're just like, well. Gosh, I you must know so much. I revere you as a deity, but at the end of the day, you know, it's there to be had, not just kind of written over or anything. I think that's kind of where uh, we get a little confused. But, I mean, this is the natural law of things. The, uh, the fabric and the material that kind of weaves in and out of our existence and uh, stabilizes and uh, makes it kind of make sense to me. And like I said, I've uh, like I learned this a long time ago, but I didn't understand it. It took it took me a couple of years of observing to really uh, solidify the potency that this carries. And uh, revisiting it in the hindsight of knowing, um, it's like 
great, I can write these things down very simply, and I don't feel like there's a person I can't explain this to. So, the time, time well spent there. Uh, I think, I think it's very basic, but at the same time, all encompassing. So, if you'd like, I'd like to go over them. And I'd love to hear what you have to, uh, g- yes, feedback. That's always very good. It's always a very fruitful conversation when, uh, two self-similar comprehensions are in play. So, uh, like I said, some of it is like, oh, well, I, yes, of course, that only makes sense. But together, it's so simple. Uh, so, these are the hermetic principles by, uh, the universe, by Spencer. Um, so the first natural law there is, uh, it's kind of just that first defining step is the law of mentalism, being that everything is in the mind, um, it's, it's fractured through a mental state. It doesn't matter, like, if I'm eating an orange or, uh, slaying a lamb. It all processes through the mind, through this, this electrical storm happening, playing out my, my brains. Uh, the thought is what always forms first. And then physicality follows. So, you know, something I mean, it's only as solid as you're going to perceive it. It doesn't mean, like, I can't just put my hand through a fucking wall or something. Um, but it does mean recognizing it by the recognition it's in our mind. That being said, uh, our thoughts create our existence, truly. Um, if, you, if you change your thoughts, you can change the quality of your experience. So if you are so hell-bent on seeing, you know, the negative side of things, uh, you could be handed, like, a trunk full of gold, or you could just be handed this, like, ripe opportunity, but the mind has m- melded itself to to accept something different. And so we'll, we'll be handed this pot of gold, and we'll be like, oh, maybe it was stolen, or... You know, you, you question this this opportunity, and you break it down till it's nothing, till all you have is a box of lead. Uh, so if you if you change your thoughts, you change the quality of your experience, and if you want something different, then you have to do something different. You have to think differently, approach it from another perspective. Uh, and that really is, I mean, that's the first law: is that everything is mind. Uh, they say we are the universe experiencing uh, itself through this uh, human perspective, but I mean, ultimately, we have this massive universe inside of us. So, uh, you know, we we only perceive it through the mind. Uh, even emotions of the heart have to filter through the mind at some point. Uh, so, that kind of leads me into uh, the second law, the natural law, and that's correspondence. This is one that's kind of been a little bit more widely popularized in this uh, newest age movement. And that is what is above, so below, and what is below as above. Um, This all-encompassing macrocosm outside of us, this totality, reflects equally the infinitesimally small microcosm, the the individual units. I'm s- something that you you know and you're well versed in is that this reality is holographic in its own nature, and you break down the word holographic, you you uh, see the root hol holistic hologram, and that being stated, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you have like a bunch of Lego building blocks, all different materials, you know, you build this uh, wonderful house. You can take them apart, and it's like, okay, the, the, there are these individual units, but they're all kind of a little different. However, with a hologram, something that's holographic, uh, like let's say we have a uh, like a cube, like being projected 
through light. And to us, it's solid. However, it's, it's just a uh, vibration of light. Now, if you split a little piece of that cube, you still have the exact same material. Uh, it's unwavering, uh, but it's the same as the whole. So the whole holistic, the holographic, the hologram. Uh, so to understand a piece, uh, to understand the, the macrocosm, the stars and the universe, the things outside of us, you must understand the microcosm. And to understand the microcosm, you you first must realize that it's all, yes, whatever, it's connected, but it is infinitely mirroring itself. Uh, we see we see these self-similar things. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence, for example, and the golden ratio, they go hand in hand. You know, the, um, the joints in my fingers and the bones in my hand correspond to the way a sunflower blooms and the way a tree branches out and the way a river flows and uh, just the rate at which we walk and breathe. Everything has this beautiful mathematic correspondence in People will be like, oh, that's a very cold way of thinking about it and measuring the universe, but it is that other side of the coin. There's nothing not beautiful about it. It's just another way of looking at it. Uh, so the universe is inherently fractal. Uh, it is self-similar across all spectrums, uh, which leads us to the third natural uh, law, and that's that's vibration. Again, this is another. Uh, it's it's becoming more popular with all these, uh, you know, publications and people coming out and saying, "Hey, man, I dig your vibe." Uh, you know, it's it's become this relevant thing again. Uh, it's always been relevant, but it states that there is nothing truly at rest. I mean, on the surface, something may seem completely solid. But when you really break it down, when you really look into it, there is motion, there is vibration, there is no non-motion. And, and the state of rest, like we perceive death, is just this ridiculous concept that's a cop-out. Um, there's always more. There always is more. Nothing is completely at rest. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, it just transmutes. Um, all of this existence is vibration. Solidity is an illusion of vibratory differential. So when you take something like light, sound, uh, matter, antimatter, it's just different rates of vibration. People are so uh, fixated like, ooh, pick up, uh, pick up this quartz or pick up this ball of lead. You feel, you feel that right there? Well, yeah, okay, whatever. It's vibration, man. Uh, us, we are just kind of like light condensed to a certain vibration as uh, well as sound and everything that seems so terribly solid. We're all moving. We're all going somewhere. We're, we, we have this innate ability to not not move. So uh, just any any of all of this, everything that passes through the mind, it's it's all vibrating. Even even the mind has this potent vibration. So even like thoughts, thoughts have forms, and thoughts form first, so that has a certain vibration. Uh, you take negativity and all of that, and it feels a certain way. And you know, you're around a person, and you're just like, I can't explain it, man, but I get really weird vibes from this guy. It's not to be explained. It just is self-explanatory. Um, but on the on the topic of like, ooh, good vibes, bad vibes, and uh, good and evil, whatever, man. Uh, the fourth, the fourth law, the fourth principle is polarity. So you have everything that I've talked about so far. Everything has this dual nature. The mind, uh, in which everything passes through, perceives everything within a duality of the spectrum. Uh, for instance, we have, uh, you know, left and right hemispheres of the brain. Uh, we have these radical concepts of, like, good, evil, and uh, a coin, for God's sakes. A coin has a heads and a tail. And, uh, 
You know, every everything's kind of divided amongst itself. So my thing is, you know, these are all kind of just things that we perceive through the mind, uh, that everything is opposite to a degree. But my what I pressure people to consider is what is the difference between good and evil and heads and tails or a Republican and a Democrat, you know? And if you if you take the example of temperature, we have the, uh, the idea of uh, hot and cold. Like, ooh, you know, while well, I'm warm, ooh, I'm cold. But can you point to me on a thermometer with a, with a pen or mark a line and say, this is the defining moment at which hot becomes cold. You know, my, like, okay, I'll, I'll draw the line at 60 degrees, but somebody comes along and is like, well, bro, I'm from Minnesota, and you're out of your mind. So it's all, I mean, it's all different perspectives of uh, polarity. But, like, you have you have heat, and then you have the absence of heat. It's not hot and cold. It's one thing, and it's, it's the presence of one thing, and then the lack of presence. So it's this... Uh, it's this long spectrum. So everything is identical in nature, but different in degree. So I like, I like saying this because it's, it's true. All conflicting differentials have at some level, they, they have this ability to be reconciled. And yes, that includes a paradox. This thing that, uh, is so, uh, self damning and like really, you know, messes with our heads. But that's, that's just, it's beautiful. Like, you can reconcile a paradox on some level. Everything can be reconciled. So, you, like, for example, the unified field theory. That's a little bit out there of a concept, but so is a freaking paradox. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. So, every, okay, a paradox is so, so out there, but so is the unified field theory. Saying that, you know, all things are one thing. And that everything is a part of one whole organism. So even a paradox at that level can be reconciled. Uh, the fifth, the fifth principle is, uh, rhythm. And that, uh, all things have an outward and an inward. Uh, there is this natural flow to things. Uh, you know, for example, uh, like it, it's it's in layers, you know. We've got waves and tides, and so like with the influx of a tide, you also have waves rolling in and out. And with the outflux of a tide, you still have waves rolling in and out. So it just goes to show you that there is this fractal nature to existence. Now, like everything has a rise and a fall, a crest and a trough. So like a pendulum swing resonates in everything and at the end of the day this is you know it's like oh wow these are such rigid concepts but they're mostly just tendencies truly you know existing most certainly but if you want to if you want to overcome these these tendencies of the universe it requires like so much energy and for example if you have a man who's determined to uh, get away from shore, this man is going to have a hell of a hell of a time rowing out to see if the tide's coming in. It's working against him as he's trying to, trying to move. But if he's smart, he knows the tides have this ebb and flow, so he decides to go out on the ocean when the tide is going out. So instead of expelling so much force, he's using the natural flow of the earth to get him where he wants to go. And like I said, it, it can be overcome. It just requires a hell of a lot of energy and uh, attention to these things. If, if you wanted to go with the go with the tide, you can do that. That's the smart thing to do. It's the easy route. But if you were hell bent on breaking this rule, you can do it. It just you're going to be tired after rowing. You know, and on the proverbial waves coming in. So, um, that being said, with the, um, with me saying, you know, there's just, there are just tendencies that can be overcome. There is this underlying cause and effect 
which is the sixth principle, cause and effect. Every cause has an effect, and every effect has a cause. So if you're going to row out to sea with the tide coming in, the result of that is that you're going to be exhausted, and you're not going to get as far as you want to go. But if you use the tide, you're going to get a lot farther on a lot less energy. So um, everything has a cause and effect, and that truly is one of the most rigid things that I've talked about so far, and that's because it's just, it's the law of things. Uh, um, chance, as we as we know it, this, this randomness of life, is only a name given to a law that's not been recognized yet. So, there are, like, so many planes of causation, you know, in, uh, in uh, lighting, uh, lighting a fire, cause and effect. Or uh, voting for president, cause and effect. It uh, everything has its just result. So this this is like one of the most basic laws. And you know, yes, there is free will. Most certainly, there is free will. We we really can do anything we want. We can we can uh, row out to sea with the tide coming in. But with cause and effect, if you break one of these natural laws, which very possible. There's free will, yes, but none that can ignore the law without consequence. So, yeah, like I said, you can break a natural law, but not without suffering some sort of, uh, some repercussion. And, uh, some people think, you know, oh, you know, karma can be instant or karma takes too long. It just, it depends on what's, like, set up. In, in, in karma's way, if we, if we are to understand this. And this kind of delves into the fact that, oh, cause and effect, yeah, karma, you know, we see that in tons of theology and stuff, but it's never, like, properly defined. Uh, you know, everybody tries to work their way around it, but there really is no escaping this. Very, very basic. Uh, A, B, you know, you do A, B happens. And, uh, because of, uh, B, you know, another A has to come about, and it just forever and ever, and Amen. But um, if you think about somebody uh, sitting in the middle of a ring of dominoes with dominoes on both sides and uh, it just goes all the way around, yeah, you can knock over dominoes and sit and wonder and wait, but eventually it comes back around and hits you. Uh, it just depends on, just depends on what's there. Uh, the seventh natural law, and I think one of, uh, one of the more unexplored regions of, uh, the governing format of existence is the, uh, principle of gender. Uh, everything has a masculine and feminine. They, they manifest on all planes. And we here, in this reality, in this point in time, this wavelength, this vibration, bro, we are only seeing the physicality manifest. Um, you know, it does. It manifests on this plane. You know, uh, you know, everybody has their corresponding physical gender. Everybody's born with uh, certain bits, as it were. But it's unexplored, in part because you have all of these people that are just like. I feel like I need to have tits, but I don't have boobs, and, you know, they, they just, they fancy a certain person, and you just, with the way life and course, everything that corresponds to this life right now is set up, you know, it's been, it's been demonized and all these things, and I'm not saying, like, go out and sleep with whatever rock you want to, but, like, for God's sakes, uh, there, there is this massive diversity. And, you know, that plays directly into the law of polarity. Uh, the good and the evil, the one or the other, the masculine, the feminine. But like I said, it's just how we perceive it. It's just this huge spectrum. They're all points on this endless spectrum of perspective. So I think with the, um, with this exploration of, <sighs> I'm gonna hate myself for saying this, but like, Caitlyn Jenner, this, this person, who has not only the resources, but the potency to make this statement. Uh, it's, um, it's starting the conversation, you know, as opposed to just like, 
you know, male and female bathrooms. It's like they're all the same fucking toilet, man. You know, we had unisex bathrooms in our house forever. You know, I've got tons of roommates who are who are girls, and we all use the same restroom. So we I, there's this weird like block set in the way right now that we see it's one thing or the other thing and I think with that in play we're coming to realize like you know uh, maybe maybe not so rigid bro chill so uh, gender manifests on this plane as uh, the genitalia but uh, masculinity this potent uh, this, this set of being it's logical, it's analytical, and there's all these, like, linear thoughts. So, you know, a, a masculine thought uh, is point A, point B, straight line. And, you know, get to point A. Quickest, quickest way to get from point A to point B is a straight line. Now, that's very, very left brain. That's the male side of the brain, the logical side. Uh, the one that equates all of these equations and makes all of this world try and make sense, tries to bend it. And um, I think we've just really forced the bending. Uh, so it's a little it's a little rough right now. But the feminine on the opposite side of the coin is that creativity, the, uh, the compassion, and the, the holistic thoughts. It really is um, it really is a holistic world. And so uh, we are just struggling with masculinity in a feminine world you know we all come from feminine energy that's where we come from but we've kind of had all the stuff set up and like i said it's one of the least um one of the least explored principles i think um before i get to the um to the last one uh i want to explain that you know, the seven principles, uh, you know, they can be found in a lot of books, but there is this force behind all of it. Um, some people would say, oh, it's God, or something else. We, we've always struggled with it. We don't know what the hell to call it. And if you think of the principles as pillars in a room, you know, okay, the fabric of existence is what it's all holding up and defining and securing. But pillars don't float. There has to be foundation to this thing. This, you know, we, we, we've lost sight of the, the ground that we tread. And, you know, because of that, you ask any, uh, any man, woman, or child, you know, what comes first? What comes first in your life? And most people will say, oh, uh, God comes first, or my family comes first, or oh, I have to work, or just something along those lines. But a principle is the first thing. Number one, man, and people have been living without principle for the longest time. Uh, like people will pick and choose their different principles from theologies all around the planet and say, hey, I've got a pretty good grasp on this. But until that truly is placed first, you know, we're, we're just kind of digging underground looking for treasure when it is, in fact, the ground we stand on now. And so uh, we call the eighth principle the lost principle. Ooh, 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 ooh. And it's not so much lost as it has been forgotten or overlooked. And we, um, as a species, I think... Like, right now is the crucial time to, like, pick this up and really adhere to this thing, the foundation first. Um, I save it for last because I think it's probably the most important thing. Um, and some people would say, you know, oh, love, love defines all this stuff. And, you know, we've really bastardized that term, man. And so uh, it's care that makes this make sense. Not, not compassion, because compassion is just... The mind and the heart going, hey, this thing has to resonate somehow. But care, truly care, caring, the, the act of doing, the, the process of what it takes to do something. If you want to take action, you first have to feel it. 
in your heart. It starts in the heart. The heart is the first thing that forms when we're when our cells are dividing. It's the very first chamber, the first thing that's detectable when a child is conceived is the heartbeat. That's the first thing they look for. And so the heart being the first thing, that's where it starts. We have to feel something. But it can't just like sit there because then, you know, that's, oh, that's passion, you know, that's anger and uh, that's just a feeling. That's just something festering in your chest, in your soul even. But after that, like, you have to think about it. You've got to think about what you're feeling. And if we can't truly define it, we're, we're stuck there, you know, but between our head and our heart. And that's, that's compassion. That's, that's the, that's the being trapped between the head and the heart. And it's not a, it's not a bad thing. For God's sakes, if your gears are turning, just keep them turning. But then, like, from your heart, you have to feel, and then it has to go to your head. Because if you don't think about what you're feeling, then you just kind of lash out and uh, lust in a certain direction, whether it's uh, learning or uh, loving. It, if there's no direction, then there is no way. So after that, you have to you have to know enough to act on something, you have to feel enough to think enough to act enough. So it goes from your heart to your head to your gut, and you act with our gut. You have these three centers of the body that operate as furnaces almost, where uh, vibration, bioelectricity circulate, most certainly. And so if you're stuck feeling something, not thinking about it, you'll never be able to act. And if you're just acting blindly, then you're never going to feel what it is you're doing, especially if you're not thinking about it. So that to me is the most fundamental thing is that like alchemical process in the body of turning uh, this uh, feeling of lead to to this end product of acting and that's that's gold man truly that's gold uh, and so I feel that's kind of what we're missing right now is just this ability to care to give a fuck and I mean, there, there are so many things. There's this uh, mass amount of masculine energy that's kind of dammed up the flow. And we're not seeing that natural pattern occur. But, I mean, it's happening, but it's happening slower. Um, we're on this downward slope. So if we could just recognize that, yes, it's there's this flow to life then we can ride the wave. If we if we understand the momentum we gain as we go down, however far down this this wave takes us, we can ride it up into this femininity, this this reemergence of creative energy. And like you you see um you see this wave throughout history, throughout the things that shaped our civilization. So, you know, you have the um the very, very intense, uh, like the, the Inquisition, that's a very masculine mind thing, you know. I'm going to torture you until you tell me what I want to hear. And, you know, that's that's A and B. Uh, people tried to make an art of it, but it's still, it's very A, B. It's a means to achieve an end. No in-between, but what little there is. And so, after that I really could be stupid about this I could be wrong but whatever as an example like a feminine point in our history this this turning point of uh, theology and philosophy you look at places like Greece and like the the emergence of the Renaissance where all of these feelings were mapped out and said you know, hey this has some validity too so it's it's there and it's there to be acknowledged once you acknowledge and learn, you know, all you have to do from there is understand. So you you acknowledge with your heart, you explain it with your mind, and then once you have that process figured out, however fucking long it takes you, uh, like your your mission in life could be to just make that woman on the corner 
in downtown wherever, a person you've never met smile and go about her day a little differently. And you could have struggled with everything in your life up to that point just for that. And you, you die. You get hit by a car. Well, that's it, man. Like, all of this process has happened. But until you act, nothing really moves forward. So you have um, this uh, – you see these three things kind of manifest in people, and they, some people kind of get stuck there. You've got, like, uh, people like uh, Stephen Hawking. Good God, Stephen Hawking. Why is that so hard to remember? Uh, the speak and spell. That is Stephen Hawking. Uh, you know, he, when you think of that, he's like, oh, that's a very smart man. Well, that's about, that's about all there is to that. You know, we think of him, we don't think of him as going out and protesting a certain thing or just like, you know, being this abundantly, this abundantly flowing fountain of love. We think about what he's contributed intellectually because that's where he is on this, this journey. That wherever, you know, wherever the hell he is, that's where he is. He specialized himself in the head. Uh, you have people that just uh, feel so much. And that's kind of where a lot of people are right now. Where we all feel that something's kind of wrong, but there's a lot happening and we can't quite wrap our heads around it. So we're stuck in this, like, oh, God, give me some freaking antidepressants. Because this is all so terrible. So, I mean, like, Gandhi... Just, I'm giving, like, really crude examples. If you can think of any other ones, like, please share. But, like, Gandhi was, like, very heart-centered. Uh, and, you know, he... Everybody has, like, something wrong with them. But, you know, everybody is, like, perfect to their own degree. Everybody has their own field of expertise to bring to the table. But, like, Gandhi was, like, really heart-centered. Uh, you know, that's where everybody kind of knows him from. It's his... Uh, the way he made people feel and think about things. So, uh, I'm trying to think of who, like, would just be, uh, okay, so, like, somebody who just kind of comes from their gut would be, uh, like Donald Trump. Somebody who just, like, opens their mouth and it's like, and this dude's about to be the president, you know? I mean, there's, there's a chance, there's a chance, I'm not saying anything, uh, but, you know, he's just action, action, action. You know, let's build a wall. Let's do this thing. And, you know, yeah, whatever. It resonates with people. It's because people are stuck in their gut, you know, just, just acting, acting, acting without really feeling or thinking. There are hints of it in all things, but, you know, everybody kind of has their own way of going about things. And the process of going from your heart to your head to your gut, it's this perfect organic way of going about this existence at least from at least from where i'm coming from i really don't claim or pretend to be an authority on anything i just know that like everybody has something to bring to the table you know whether it's the equivalent of peas carrots the table uh or like a whole roast or a fork you know everything is kind of essential to enjoying a proper meal and you know i think it's just I think it's about time we ate our fucking peas, man. There it is. I said my piece. Well. I don't know how to speak after that. I'm glad I got that recorded. If anybody's watching now, I hope you think about it and really think about it and comprehend it. These ideas have been around for thousands of years, but I haven't heard them explained so so well in a very long time, and really never in public, never in this society, if you will. Yeah, don't you know I'm crazy? <laughs> well, I guess we all are. You have to be. Well, you have to be because that's the only way you can realize... You're not and you're sane because it's all either polarized or corresponding to another layer. Yes! So, I've had a little bit of a... a yeah. <laughs> uh, I've thought about these before, but that was... You got it all lined up. I wrote about it all, on all these ideas here. And even sometimes where you were saying the beginning of it, and I kind of like carried out 
what I felt like were thoughts, then you'd like finish off wrap, bringing it back around. So it's almost like you talked about how everything's a metaphor. Everything is best explained through metaphors. There's no point in doing it. And then you think about multiple layers of reality being explained in different actual experiences. Well, you'd have to use metaphors because one, what's happening here wouldn't exactly meet up with what's happening there. So metaphors is the language of, of the truth. But um, it's like some, every, somebody's bring, uh, everyone brings something to the table. It's kind of like these were like those pack of lunch meals that you get as a kid. Like you put <laughs> each one into like its own box so that you don't really need to to rely on anything else. But when you got in the world and want to experience this, you gotta you gotta take it in from everywhere. Yeah, um, bring, you, you bring the crackers, man, and I will bring <laughs> I will bring the bologna. Nobody eats the fucking cheese anyway. <laughs> Oh man! All right. Um, I'm just gonna go off of because I don't know what to do now, which I really have. Ne- this never happened before. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go off of some of the ideas that I I got from. One of the main things is how once again, in explaining these concepts, uh, and that's real good as long as the acid doesn't stay on too long. Mm-hmm. In explaining these concepts, you would go through the meaning of it and what we gain by understanding that, and then what can be lost. Not really lost, there's nothing there, it's just balance or imbalance, but what happens out of the imbalance, what is, you know, what happens there when that principle is not maintained and respected and understood. And so one of the main things I want to do is kind of go back through them all real quick and then re- restate that, form that so that people get the idea that it's, it's not a, I don't, know, I don't want to say it's a manual, but it's almost like a manual for how we can approach the universe. And none of them really work alone. They are pretty much, it's like a painting or a meal that adds up, in not even in succession, but you all together they have to be organized. And uh, when you keep them all together and you get the whole picture, whatever you're looking at, it's as if... It's not high, no, there's nothing hidden anymore about it. It's as if you can see the whole thing as if it were an object and you can, you're rotating it around, but it's whatever it is, is the concepts of the experience of reality, it's just consciousness. So without these principles, because we probably possibly would know them, you know, in a previous society where there wasn't so much BS, or maybe going to school and just the simple stuff that your parents would teach you would be based on these natural principles, and so we wouldn't have to be taught them in that way. Other than, you know, we probably wouldn't just wake up knowing them, although maybe we could. But, um... You get hit hard enough in the head, you you wake to something completely different, you know? So, um... Uh, it takes objectivity, kind of stepping back and observing. Like I said, it took me a couple of years of, like, knowing these things and going, hey, you know, that really makes sense to me. But understanding and seeing it objectively play out through every facet of life and love and loss. I mean, that's it, man. So, uh, yeah, I can, I can dig it if you can dig it. It's kind of like we look at everything, at least in this society, is for an object of consciousness or a, a thing. But we only see the surface. We only see one side, one face, one facet of that glowing jewel of consciousness. When you turn it, you angle it, you rotate it, and it's funny because you don't get, you angle it, and you don't get the other side, which is just opposite of that side, you get a completely new idea that represents that same central core, and you do it all the way, and you get maybe seven or eight principles. Um, so, first one, mentalism, I like how you said it's fr- everything's fractured through the mental state as if it's a prism, the mind is the prism, not prison, but the prism, but it could be, if you don't respect that, then it could be a prison, because if you get on a negative mental pattern, everything is shaded that way. And so, uh, but that's where I get the idea that fear is basically the mind killer. It's the lack of understanding that the mind is what is going to be the, the, the initial governor of what we're experiencing, our reality, as well as our uh, adherence of all the other facets or principles. But the first concept is that it's in our head, it's in our mind. It's uh, that we have control over that if we don't have control over our gender, you know, the, the rhythm of everything, all, all these other things. We have control of how we choose to perceive and how we organize ourselself in reflection and in, in, in uh, relation to what we're looking at. So 
when every layer you go, you get it's like you, you power up. You get another uh, a layer of power to the world. And so this is what they were doing for thousands of years. This is why this information is written on the walls throughout every nook and cranny of all the civilizations that had any impact overall that are, we can see that didn't turn to dust immediately. So it's really... It should be people should be interested. Uh, well, I'm not gonna say what people should or shouldn't be, but those that know should be. In, I, I'm, yeah, what you just said, the way you organized it, I, you know, because there's I, there's no videos where people actually finally, you know, you gotta buy it or go through a website and they, it's all over the place. That, that's good. All right. Um, so fear is kind of the mind killer. It's the it's what's what what is present when the first principle is not comprehended or kept in check. Or it, it is ignored. Then the correspondence is a little bit more. It's literally the next layer up, and it's more complicated. Um, it's similar to polarity or duality, but it's more basic in the sense that it's not yet polarized to any concept or any side of any concept. It's literally the self-similarity between one layer and the next, and how those layers can represent whether it's right or left, or up or down, or in or out. It's simply one layer reflects the next or the other. And that you relate to that very nicely to the uh, holographic projection theory, which is a little bit more than a theory now. I mean, shoot, shoot now there's scientific ideas uh, and, and experiments coming out showing particles acting like it's you know a hologram, like it's a, a consciousness-dependent hologram, so it's much more than a theory now. And it really was much more than a theory a long time ago. People just ignored it because well, that kind of throws the whole show off if you realize we're in a projection system, and it's based upon these principles in our mind. Um, but uh, and you you related to the uh, cube, and in a way the fractal projection, and mainly a, f a fractal holographic disk. The way you can uh, crack a holographic disk into a bunch of pieces, and you'll get smaller images of the whole throughout them all. And so it's similar to duality or polarity, but it's not that yet. It's simply self-similarity. And so then maybe you can help me out with this one. Um, so the, what, not the, what I came up with, but not not obeying, but not uh, acknowledging and corresponding with this law, uh, law of correspondence. Well, the one thing is that the way you would go about that is by failing to correspond or to realize there's correspondence and to basically realize that what happens on one layer directly shines through, projects through to these other layers and what we're experiencing on one layer is being projected, shine through from a higher or a deeper or however you want to put it, another layer. And so what would you say the result of that is? I could say off the top of my head that is if we're a being in these is kind of labyrinth, but it's, it's a labyrinth if you don't obey this the law. If you see it, it's perfection. You know, without obeying or, or acknowledging that, we become in a way we feel like we're lost. We, we basically it's like a it's like we're blinded to only the layer that we're in, and if we get it's basically like it's the way of getting trapped. If we ignore the mentalism and ignore the correspondence. We can't see these other layers, and then we can't see that our mind is making the pathway one or the other, so a person will be kind of blinded or trapped within their situation. You can add to that if you have anything else to... Um, <clears throat> failing to relate to correspondence uh, and the corresponding factor that the mind has on all of this, um, we, we become so focused on like our unit that we fail to recognize that you know within within us is this whole other layer this this universe if we don't understand what's going on with us and within us how could we ever hope how could we ever possibly dream of getting a grip on the things outside of us the things that we we, we touch and love the, the out the external you know so you know yes we can go about our lives doing just watching like just watching football and eating popcorn and uh, beating our wives but until we realize that all of that has its own relation to what's going on inside of us like where we're coming from and we, we will have no idea where the hell we're going uh, we'll just keep 
repeating the same pattern over and over and over and over. And, like, it, it is insanity. I know everybody's heard the, you know, if you, if you do the same thing over and over and expect a different result, then, you know, you're, you are stuck in this insidious loop of uh, misrepresenting correspondence. And uh, if you don't change that primary function, if you refuse to see the pot of gold for what it is, uh, you know, you're, you're stuck. And uh, even if you change just slightly, just slightly a little bit, if you just shine the light a little differently on this pot of gold and see it glisten in a way you haven't seen it glisten before, you know, you're, you're already halfway there. You just have to uh, correspond your mind. I don't know. I want to, like, make a sentence, just like a single sentence that encompasses every word of the of the principles. Because it's there. It's it's Those are, like, the singular proverbial uh, words that, you know, can be explained through all of these metaphors and pretty things. But, you know, until we can simplify it for ourselves enough, until we break down this way too complex topic, we will never not uh, find find our way forward. So that's that's where I see that. If we ignore the correspondence, then uh, we we ignore the validity of our own experience. Yeah, man, you just I was gonna say something just like that, <laughs> but um, I'm gonna still go through it. But that last part you added. We ignore the validity of our own experience because everything that I led up to is that it we lose ourselves. But the way you you said the next few sentences in one sentence through that, and the yeah, goal would be to see to say all the principles in one. That would be like all the the, the vowels or the uh, the original sounds in one one language, maybe one one utterance. Probably, I don't know what would happen at that point. Maybe something you would unlock a code or something in the universe. Um, Universe would just sneeze and everybody would like go, What the what? hell? <laughs> what was that? Um, God. So but you, you you explained it um and it clarified it. Not corresponding with self similarity makes us lose that connection of self. And in that same way, we lose the connection to other selves around us, not seeing how we correspond to how pe- we feel of people acting to us and how we act upon them, so other, we influence others, and then we wouldn't see how this universe corresponds to the higher universes or the lower, or in other words, because I was saying higher and lower before, but it's really the universe within the immaterial world with the physical, maybe the metaphysical, with the physical external universe here. It wouldn't, there wouldn't be that connection, and that connection is born through mind. So, and then you you mentioned insanity, and that's when the insanity idea comes in. And since there's correspondence in that metaphysical plane, it's the future, past, and present as well. There's no longer correspondence between that. There you get to the repeating pattern, where we lose control of progression. And uh, and then you you kind of wrapped up with the refuse to to see the gold, which relates to the the mentality before, and it's kind of like refusing to see the path. And so all these things, it's really a really powerful principle there. And of course, all of them line up together. But you know, at, at layer two, if you you ignore that, everything turns into a big jumbled mess. But then you see seven, eight down the line, how much the universe could turn into this dream, a paradoxical paradise, you know, dream. And so, I think that was a good a good um correspondence on that one. Um, you said it. Ah. Uh, the law of vibration. And that one I liked a lot because it's like a trick. Nothing is truly at rest when all things are examined closely, directly. It's revealed that there's there's motion and change at every layer, everywhere, and from there that there is no non-motion. There is no true stillness. The state of rest, or what we perceive as the end or death, is just a transfer to another layer that we're not actually looking at. From the one that you know we perceive the the rest or the end so there is no end quote unquote there is no no there is no zero and there is no death it is an illusion and then you, you you said how the person is basically light condensed to a slower vibration vibration 
and yet it's all still in motion. It's basically fluid. Consciousness is like a gas or a fluid. And we are consciousness, and the world is made out of consciousness. And uh, so then the, the loss of that principle is basically the belief in death. The belief that things are dead still. We're in a cold, dark, rocky universe where there, if we don't make it happen, plug in the diesel and start the truck up or whatever, it's, nothing's going to work. It's not going to, you got to force it to do something for you. When in reality, if you sit back and fold your legs up into a, you know, a lotus, everything still works. Everything still goes. It just happens. It just spins around you as it goes. We're in this kind of carousel. So that's that layer kind of wrapped up really quick. You can add to that if you want. Uh, just that, uh, you know, with, uh, I'm just going to relate it because crystals are a very, very big deal right now. And, uh, it's, I mean, that that's coming to the forbearing of our consciousness because that in and of itself is a lesson that we're going to have to adhere to uh, because that corresponds one and the same with us. Um, if I could just move to a little bit of an Eastern mindset, uh, you have these uh, this uh, whole new understanding, but it's ancient, of like chakras, and energy, flow and stuff, but... You know, with like the duality, we have like you know the oh the Western mentality or the ooh the Eastern mentality. You know, there's very mystic, but you know this whole Western uh, philosophy. Our medicine is very A B. You know, one is very masculine, one is very feminine. So we, as like the East, is Westernizing their mindset, and the West is slowly incorporating these teachings, slowly but albeit progressing to to meld together. So you have all of this uh, new resurgence of the talk, like this this talk here. The fact that we're having this conversation in and of itself is a miracle of circumstance and time. Uh, it's not chance. Like I said, chance is just a law that has not yet been defined. But vibration, we're, we're starting to incorporate all these other teachings from the East, uh, chakras and uh, pressure points and all these things that like, bring us as a unit makes us make sense internally so uh, understanding the internal mechanisms of how energy flows uh, when we come to that very very solid understanding of how we work we and go oh damn well that makes sense or oh I get the same feeling that you're getting about this thing you know there has to be some sort of relation there I have um, I have these here they're the uh, I don't know. I don't feel like scooting too far forward. They're the platonic solids, but they're done in the colors of the electromagnetic color spectrum. And it's m merging two hemispheres of thought. Everybody asks me always, uh, oh, are those chakras? And I say, uh, well, kind of, more or less. Uh, you know, you have the natural shape of uh, atomic structures and uh, electrical energies in and around the... Uh, the fabric of existence that holds and structures all things, but at the same time, it's all energy as well. So you have the perfect melding of uh, energy and physicality in in the same in the same situation. So um, you know, everything has its proper wavelength, and in that wavelength, there's a certain vibration. So you know, all these seem uh, like on the surface, on paper, uh, very separate things, but ultimately it's just one very broad concept that uh, uh, self relates to itself and uh, exists for the other thing to make sense. Uh, they they just feed each other. Uh, so you know, just I guess to be crude, if you get a certain vibe, bro. Follow that. You know, take take into consideration that what you're experiencing is a valid thing. To do anything less would be a besmirching of your own experience. So, yeah, pick up a pick up some hematite or put a uh, put a crystal in your window. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It matters what you feel and what you think about that thing and how you act on that thing. So, that's that's kind of you know vibration for me is that you know everything is impossibly valid at the same time so word <laughs> in word a vibration sonic yes yes spelling for god's sakes i feel like you're beyond yourself here because you drove me deeper to the degree where 
it's not just the belief in death that creates the stillness. It's the belief, it's the loss of the vision of the motion of all things and the capability to interact. And it's like a death while you're alive. And you don't have to go and die physically. It's that you're dead while you're alive. Uh, it's like the crystal. The crystal holds an energy vibration that when it's charged, they're piezoelectric. When they're, uh, there's pressure, they emit a, a, a charge or a frequency. That is basically a, a co combination of the shape, the physical aspect, and the energy, the vibration aspect. They become one, just like the body, just like a light bulb, just like anything. The sun, a flower. It is life is the combination of the solid and the energetic, or the vibration and the perception of the slower what we think is still, which is actually just a slower vibration. And so within that, we have harmony from the vibration and unification of the two. And then so basically, you know, we lose that continuation, continuity when we don't respect the vibration, we don't acknowledge it and see that it's all vibration. It's not just that we believe that it ends or something like that, it's that it ends as soon as we stop noticing it. And then you brought up the shapes, the uh, solids, and that drives even harder how it's the mixture of matter and energy vibration that generates life in the universe, generates change, generates time, correspondence, mentality, all those things, um, and basically, the geometry, we've, we've mentioned this before, the geometry equals frequency, the frequency equals vibration. When they're put together, you create the world and the way things are experienced and they're interacting, that only works through that harmonized unification of the, the various levels. And so then to ignore that is not only to ignore the, the vibration and overall there is death, is to ignore feeling like we are the crystal and the frequency is emotion and mind and consciousness is to is to die consciously is to basically to ignore feeling to experience death in the moment and which is because the this vibration relates to the harmony of the mind because that's not a solid thing the brain is solid the mind consciousness is vibration it's waving through the air it's emitted so it's the death of the mind in the way and uh, it's literally living while dead and dying while alive. And so you, you, you keep flipping it and pushing it further, and it's like, I don't know, I feel like I'm high off the conversation, which is how it's supposed to work. And uh, that's, that's good. Man, uh, Have some of my brain vibrations. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. You could charge up a, a crystal, but um, my roommate's a little loud. You can... Hear him? Excuse me. Yeah, I keep expecting somebody to walk through my door anyway, so... Whatever, man. Moving right along, vibrating right along here. Just everything's in motion. And you could even say, we're not moving, it's moving through us. The vibration isn't even one way or the other, it's all. It's from all angles. And that way time is from all angles. Because that ties into correspondence before as well. It's not just linear in one way. It's a, uh, a non-polarized, unipolar, uh, spherical, like a toroidal expansion outward in all yes. directions. On that note, um, I was at a. Um, I don't know. I, I want to tell a bit of a story and relate it to what's going on right now. Um, I was at. A, um, a camp out as it were there was music and fire and lights and stuff and uh, it was basically like a, like a music festival but it was it was night and we were going to stay on this uh, uh, old Indian reservation and uh, I had a lot of people offer me all kinds of illicit substances however that was the first night I ever took DMT in my life and there was this absolute objectivity, yet this utter sense of belonging to all things. So I have this beautiful trip through eternity several times over in a span of a couple of minutes and notice that, you know, oh, okay, all things are um, all things are the way they're supposed to be. Uh, every choice you make is valid to shaping your experience and all experience is valid to shaping your choices. So it's like it was this self-fulfilling uh, coming to 
coming to understand a lot of broad things in, in a single moment. And I'm not trying to dwell on that, uh, but that was a very valid part of the night. However, what came later was something that gave me a different kind of perspective and is one of the things that helped me solidify all of this. Um, after running around in the woods barefoot for God knows how long, um, I went to the main fire, the main bonfire, and there was this young man who had pupils the size of dinner plates and didn't speak to anybody for hours and hours and hours. It appeared that he hadn't been there with anybody. If there was somebody there, they had clearly went and, you know, uh, screwed off or done something else and left him to sit there. Every time I kept coming back around to this fire, he was still sitting there, just so entranced, so giving to this to this fire. And I could tell he was on something to where he was out of his body or just hyper observant of the situation. And there were so many people like sneering and laughing at this ch child of the universe who was losing his mind looking into the fire. And I was the only person that had any sort of gumption to go and observe with him. And so I sat right next to this dude I looked at the fire for a while, and I just, you know, I saw all of the alchemical process happening, and whatever, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm living this very beautiful experience. And so I just turned to him, and I say, so, what have you learned from the fire? And he said that life is in a constant state of giving, that it is only going, not coming. You put fuel on the fire and it only it only consumes and gives it doesn't go back in the cigarette only burns the cigarette smoke does not go back in it just expands never asking anything else like a a tree does not a tree does not think Oh, I must grow that I may be a home to others. I must, I must grow and spread my, spread my seed, so that life can thrive. Or I must process all of these, these elements to give off oxygen that others may live. It doesn't ask anything. It just is. It just expands. It just grows. And. That night, like, I mean, he, he said a bunch of other stuff, too, that was, like, very validating to what he was saying, but when I watched the fire, I sat with him for probably about an hour, and they were, like, constantly uh, throwing wood onto this huge flame, and, you know, the passage of time was completely distorted at that point, and I saw it at a different frame rate, almost where it was just this exhale, just consuming and only giving. So it just, it, it goes with what you were saying. It's just in this constant state of motion, this, this giving, this unspoken knowing of what, you're, what it is you're supposed to do. And at that point in my life, I wasn't very happy with where I was. I was learning all of these things and starting to apply them but when I stepped back, really stepped back and had conversations with things that I didn't know I could converse with, um, I realized that all the choices I've made thus far, every choice that humanity has made for better or for worse, led us to this moment, led us to this conversation and anything else that de derives as a result of this uh, unspoken giving, this exchange of energies. Yeah, I thought maybe that related a little bit. Yeah. The, that vibration, vibrations don't go backwards. They might go both ways in time, but they're still going out. It's just from another perspective. And I, when, when we talked about that a long time ago, and I was like, what... 
maybe for the, the the wood, it's like going backwards. It's taking from that, but it's really unraveling the energy that's in that. It's not nothing's going in reverse. It's just a continuous. And then the real you know idea is that it's a continuous exhale. Life is growth. There's no such thing as life being the opposite of growth. There's no aspect of that in existence. But you see how weird we can get where we can we're like little g gods because we can ignore the principles and then we get an inverted perception of what life should be which doesn't actually make sense but in our if we want to experience it that way we can get that obscured perception and honestly it's really weird when people do that because we don't know where we are we don't we don't know where we fit into that because then it's like well what are we then what are we just the the unraveling but it's not it's a continual expansion on all levels and you know if we're life we're alive then we're expanding we are a self, we become something different, we always were what we are, or what we were, we always are what we were, but we're not the same from what we become, so we're always becoming something new, but we've always been ourselves, so it's this continual process of changing, a paradoxical changing of, of what already is and what has been. And uh, it's really paradoxical and weird, but that's where uh, the care comes in, we skip ahead, we just kind of, kind of like you kind of got to go with it, refusing to being like I don't care about that. It's I'd rather negate that because I see it everywhere, but it doesn't make sense to me. The effect of that is losing the the wonder of of, of life of everything that it is. Um. So yeah, uh, polarity is the next one. And yes, it is. That's the uh, that's the dual nature. As we breathe right along or something, I don't know. Um, unravel <laughs> our minds polarity and that is the, the one that relates to duality dual nature which is it's little, again it's almost like it cycles back to the complexity behind correspondence now where it's more refined and this is the trick that happens in society polarized to this side polarized to the other side don't care about what's in the middle remove that care and then they'll flip-flop because you need that other side eventually, but you'll become it instead of integrating it, and you won't have any control over that. And that's where all that, that also ties into the gender, which is, again, two, one or two down. And so where it's, it, it's really weird what people are doing in the world, as well, the people that are kind of manipulating things. We can also say that they're trying to teach people by manipulating so many things because they're pushing gender or polarity one way or the other. Well, it's to show people that, We've kind of been out of polarity, out of, we've been gender biased so much, you know, it's an overly masculine society and a truly feminine world, so they're like, they're, they're plucking the strings to try and get us to, to, to realize what's going on and snap back. And as well, some are probably being generally mischievous, but, um, but that's their own mistake because that will serve us more than it serves them in the end, unless they give everything they own, everything they have, everything they gained to the people saying, well, this is why I was really doing it. Because if they don't, then that's not why they're really doing it. And it's going to bite them in the end. That's the whole cause and effect and every other correspondence and la level and layer that, that applies to that. Their their breath will become very shortened and shallow. Because that if it's for learning, if it's for growth, then it has to be allowed. When, it, when it's right, when it's time. Which is, we're nearing that time. So, and it's not because the masses are doing it. No, it's just because there's just enough that get it, that finally get it, that are awake and aware. Um, it's the one person in an audience that <coughs> that it draws the attention just enough to take you away from what it is you're perceiving. And that's a really odd metaphor, but I mean, if uh, you have a pool, uh, a wonderful pool, you can see straight through the bottom, and you maintain this pool, and you're gonna have a you're gonna have a killer barbecue, man. And when you get there, you've you've taken care of the pool so much so that you know everybody gets there, and a leaf falls into the pool and you have this like very very broad and clear thing but what you're drawn to is the one discrepancy the one thing that stands out and you don't just go oh it's a pool you go oh there's a leaf in the pool 
and it's like that one person in the audience that that coughs or uh, claps a little too long. The the differential in which we based off base our experience off of. Um, we are we are truly um, multi-dimensional beings. Uh, you know, we're we're only beginning to explore these uh, extra dimensions outside and within us. But ultimately, we are uh, we're like fourth dimensional creatures pushing for like this fifth dimension uh, that is contained in a three dimensional hologram reality based on the perception of duality. But at the end of the day, we're all just one organism constantly progressing. So. No, of course, spawns. And so within that duality, we wouldn't have the experience of difference. We would just literally be like one interconnected bubble of ideas, and that wouldn't be as it wouldn't be as unifying when we come back to that if we couldn't break away from that. And a, a good metaphor as well with the one you said is if it's a horror movie and you got the one guy that's just like, oh yeah, that's great, like woo, and everybody's like horrified and they kind of snap out of it, and like what is really going on here? The, you know everything clarifies um and then uh the duality one is re- it can go on forever it's really i mean even the experience of duality can go on forever but explaining it can go on uh it can go on and on um but basically the idea is that and i was really surprised when you said it because there is no such thing as the absence of light there is no such thing as stop or end there is only the absence of what was there's no such thing, or there's no such thing as absence of light. Well, technically, I meant to say darkness, but in the same sense, there is no such thing as the absence of light, which is darkness. What we call it. There's only the absence of light, and I kind of messed it up. But there's only light. That's all there is, and that kind of works into this holographic projection uh, theory, uh, which takes a while to, to explain. So I'm not going to go into it this this show. Um, but uh, but the idea between the polarity, the duality, is to well, what I like that you said is that the, the easiest way to explain it is what is 50%, say you have a, and when you do it mathematically, that's where the weird stuff with programming and, and, and symbolism and code and geometry and frequency all begins to play out. Say you labeled 100% of a certain amount of, of, of temperature in a certain area as 100% hot, and you label a certain area, uh, not like 212 degrees below um uh, what is it called? That's absolute zero, or you know, not not one of is that absolute? I think that is, because um, you, you, there's really no no zero for temperature. Except theoretically, well, absolute zero is the zero. But we can't perceive that because it would like instantly turn us to glass. You know what I'm saying? We, we we wouldn't correspond into that layer. We would fractalize and instantly break off into our individual cellular components. So we can't interact in that layer. We can't perceive it. Say you could, you have a 0.100 degrees or 100% heat. What would 50% hot and 50% cold be if you were literally 50% in the middle? Would that be hot or would that be cold? Technically, it would be neither. It would be both and it would be neither. So with that idea, you get that reconciliation that you mentioned where within what we think is the most hot is hot, cold is cold, it must be that. Somewhere within that, you get nothing, where it's both. And because it's both, it's neither, or it's, it's simultaneously. It's technically not neither, because that doesn't exist. It's simply the, the duality comp- collapses, and it, it transcends. And the poles reconcile, and you see that there is one thing, and you see that there's this transcendent, fluid substance that is actually explaining everything, and it's the absence of that which we call another substance. And seeing that as an actual other substance, like coldness or darkness or lack of whatever, is the mistake of polarity, of remaining polarized and not achieving that transcendent understanding of all things. Because within that, everything is a handshake. Everything is friends. Without that, they're constantly battling. It's a continuous battle between the elements, between the ideas, the concepts, the races, cultures, creeds. Everything is a battle. So that even goes into, I'm going to go right, you can add to that, but it goes into right along with the rhythm because as I kind of glanced up, I saw 
working, we know uh, from what you said, the rhythm is keeping that inward outward motion. It's almost as if the polarity becomes rhythmic with what there is to be. And within that, that change, which has it become rhythmic, when we know it's rhythmic, we, co- we understand that, we acknowledge that, and we can synergize with the highs and lows. And when we're working, the, the failure to acknowledge that is working out of rhythm, which wastes energy. So being polarized in a way is truly wasting the energy that we think we're attaching to the substance of what is and applying our energy towards that is actually in a way losing that congruence. You can add to the polarity before we move on. Um, yeah. Uh, for, for the record, Aug and I have talked about uh, lots of a lot, a lot of a lot of things. And one thing him and I have talked about um, in some pretty pretty swell detail is um, like numbers and like human interaction and how that goes into play so you've got uh, the idea of polarity you have a one thing that seems a little bit different than the other thing and uh, you say oh you know that is, there's, there's a discrepancy somewhere in there and uh, it's like asking somebody you know okay here's black here's white find me gray Find me a gray that everybody can agree on, and everybody will say no. Well, you know, uh, it's a little lighter, a little darker than this. There is no one uh, gray. It's just endless points of perspective on an endless spectrum of perspective. But there's a lot to be gained with polarity uh, in the sense that uh, while helping us break down uh, these uh, complex motifs that pervade our life... um, uh, for the for this example, I want to uh, talk about exactly what it is that uh, we are a part of. There is you, Og. There is me, Spencer. And somewhere, somehow, outside of this box, there's another observer. You, the observer. The third person in this equation. Now... But when when bouncing back these ideas between two people, we're just kind of echolocating vibration and understanding. So him and I are expanding on what it is that we already have someone defined for ourselves and solidifying that. Now that's that's the power of polarity, the the two things. Uh, finding that gray area of where you can relate. However, when you introduce a third person, uh the observer in this, the the third the third person, there's something about the number three uh, outside of polarity, the person observing these two differentials, that they gain something uh, aside from the bouncing back of uh, waves and understandings between two people. Um, so when, when you have two people in a conversation, you're basically just solidifying what it is you already know. But when a third person joins the conversation or there's another fact to that equation, uh, there's something new. There's something fresh. And that's why polarity just happens to exist in all things. We have to be able to look at two things to receive something resembling a gray, our our idea of gray or uh, lukewarm. So hopefully whoever is watching this, whoever has the patience and stomach to sit through this, uh, hopefully they'll find their, their happy little they're gray, and uh, that's that's the last thing I wanted to say on polarity is that uh, that that conversation we've rehashed over and over and over uh, is that you know there is there's a third person to this equation, on, and hopefully they're they're learning something they didn't know before based on two people solidifying their ends of the spectrum. And we did repeat, I think, the, the polarity again to rehash it. And then we did, I know you're talking about the other conversation we had with the numbers, which meant yeah. about how we would talk about this and how you would talk about it from the last time we talked about it. There's like such an expansion here, such a, a breath here, the breathing. Uh, I want to bring up a video Into the Deep on YouTube made, which is the Nine Veils Introduction and Discussion. He talks about that, how you have a line and a point and until you connect them you don't have a a real way of relating but as soon as you do you ultimately get 
a triangle. And the triangle is the symbol of multiplicity that as soon as you reach that, it's the, slow, the smallest amount that you get. You have to, oh shit, what are we doing here? Um, as soon as you reach that, you access another plane of multiplicity which expands far beyond the, the sphere or, or the plane or wherever we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, the cube. It expands in a way that can hit angles that you cannot get with those other uh, shapes, at least not in the same way. And so the way that breaks down is duality. I'm just going to rehash it real quick. When you have a conversation on a phone, two people, whatever, there's one person, and this is a communi- uh, psychology and communication. They talk about this a little bit. Because there's nonverbal communication, there's uh, like cross communication, there's uh, I can't remember the words exactly. There's continuous communication, and then there's like one-on-one communication, where it's only when you you're, you're like completely silent, basically each time. But it's always usually a continuous form of communication, a simultaneous communicating on multiple levels, and it's literally like a symphony of like uh huh and eye contact and motions, and because you can tell when a person's interested or not. And we're literally making these. Or at least our brains and our, our spirits are making these decisions, and, and it's not hidden to that on that level, because a lot of people don't know how they're doing these things. But you know, an agent uh, trained to in- interrogate people, he'll be watching everything. He'll, his brain's sitting on to, to see that level. That the person doesn't even know they're, they're speaking. They're speaking a symphony, and he's reading their minds. And that's without advanced technology. But one on one, you can only max have that person talking. And there's one communication to him, and then the other person talking or her, and then so you basically have two times, not times two, but basically happening simultaneously. As soon as you add a third, you have the two going, and each one there's there's basically a connection there, connection there, and a connection there. So you have three conversations. It goes from one that happens twice, deuce, to three that happens thrice, and it's almost like a. a Literally, would it be? Did we decide that it was nine? I think conversations. It was something like that. It was like six or nine at once, and so the level jumps from duality into multiplicity, starting at three. That's the gateway into everything, and it's the same with the the mind, heart, and gut. Those are the three minds of the person. When those are connected, there's that vibrational harmonization, that unity correspondence above below in and out all these levels so that's the being the gut the mind or the heart that's just an organ that's all that's all it is when you they're combined you get a soul human being that's essentially literally an immortal essence coming from the immaterial plane resonating here communicating ideas things when you feel from your heart your intuition your gut and you think from your mind, you're getting cosmic information that's always been here. It's eternal. It can't die. It can't go anywhere else. It's been here. So that's beyond time, beyond space. It's a paradox, but it's also a transcendence. So to so we don't spend too much time doing this. Um, it's just gone on too long. The uh, principle of cause and effect. And that was that's the basic idea behind karma. Rowing out waste energy when you're going against the tide going with it it synergizes and you get more energy than one or the other alone you actually it's basically the going with the rhythm or not the rhythm well technically that's what it is because one describes the other in the effort of which which way it's going to go i think i skipped the rhythm no we were on rhythm yeah uh going with excuse me uh, because the the waves going in and out is kind of like polarity. So when that's used in balance, going with it, it's as if there's just motion, like you know, a bobber or a thing on you know thing. I don't want to say a dead body, but like something just floating on the, the beach. It just goes. It has no control. When the mind is integrated with that rhythm, you can surf. You can do all this stuff that people love to do, or sail out past the, a certain level. And even the, with the rhythm of the winds, you can you sail a boat and things like that. You can do things that it's like the one, one on one, two, three, and then the multiplicity of every possibility that we couldn't gain without that. We couldn't gain without the rhythm. It would all fight itself. And so, the lack of using that, and to restate the lack of being a, of acknowledging polarity, 
is uh, not transcending beyond the poles. But as well, it's not seeing that the polarity is just a self-reference of one and the other. And that's our uniqueness, that's our character, because that's what you want you kind of bring up. That's not just all about crushing polarities, the fact that there's beauty in that, you know. And so with the rhythm, the, the beauty in the rhythm is you can do stuff that you couldn't do before because it's already doing it. You just kind of got to jump in, in line with the universe and allow it to push you along. Um, and uh, ignoring the effects, misaligning with the improper cause for a desire, which is the more and more extended ways that then you get, you can, you're free to break the law, but you can't ignore the consequences, and we get the karma. That you'll lead yourself down a path that you really didn't want to because you weren't following the rhythms of the beat walking down the street. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> um, so, gender. We're, we're wrapping it up here. And this is obviously how do you get gender from shapes and sounds and vibration and rhythm this is the one where it becomes a person it becomes a living essence it becomes a person an identity a character and at every level there is gender when we leave here there will be gender where whatever we were doing before when we came here there was gender this level it's feminine uh, it's feminine particularly the earth is feminine when that goes in a bunch of ways where the the masculinity of energy, consciousness, uh, the atomic energy corresponds into matter, the mother, mother earth energy or uh, uh, form, and it motivates it into basically impregnating it into becoming what we call life, a seed growing, the sun, all that stuff. So you kind of get that that breakdown in the universe basics of energy and matter. But um, uh, and so uh. So, so because we're on a physical plane where all these things are kind of put together, put together from a foundation to foundation until you get an eye on top, kind of like the pyramid, and it's an identity, they're described physically, meaning there's genitalia and, and stuff like that, and uh, masculine features and, and character to go along with that, such as strength and then creativity. The idea is that that is just the surface level. You know... Sexual organs being the difference between gender is the surface level. You twist the jewel, you look through it, you see its way of mind. Masculine, we all know this if you've been paying attention, is straight to the point, the shortest way between A and B. It's how to get it done, how to instruct, how to use an instruction manual of your mind and, and make it happen. Feminine is to find the most beautiful way, the most invigorating way, the most emotionally rewarding way, and, and what you get out of the journey rather than the results. That's why the universe at large is one big feminine experience. Whereas the, but in, in the end, it's also, it's perfect. It's perfectly one, perfectly the other. It's neither per, all technology or all spirit and organic. It's the journey and, as well as the experience because it's going to lead up to something. I like to use this because it's like a really good conversation piece. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of lessons to learn from this. Um, yeah. The the cube, the uh, the first that is that is masculinity, like in its utmost form, and so you pass on through all these different things until you get to the feminine, which is the sphere. So uh, again, it is just like it's this, this spectrum, um, and it it doesn't end there. That's just what we that's just what we perceive. You know, find me find me a more perfect shape than a sphere. We can't because that's where we're at right now. You can only go with a dimension where it's a toroid, but that's just the same thing in another perspective. Sorry. But that, that, I mean, you've got the mentalities, the genitalia, but you also have these other, on on physical levels, manifestations of gender. Uh, the, the very hard lines as opposed to um, very soft. Um, in reference to, like, some people know, uh, like, the flower of life. Um, you take spheres, circles, over and over and over and over again, you get this beautiful pattern. But when you connect the dots, you have all these, like, straight lines. They are in and of themselves respectively powerful. They are one and the same, but they are, they are two sides to the equation. And together, it is some kind of crazy stuff, truly. Not without being able to be fathomed. So, uh, you know, just inherently the gender of geometry um, 
is an important lesson as well, and that's why I got all of this. Um, I have a dragonfly, which to me shows that you know there's um there's this creature that's supposedly been around for like something like 300 million years, and it's you know it's changed in size and shape and stuff, but it's always stayed fundamentally itself. It's seen climate change over and over, and it's seen all of these different things yet remaining the same. So even though it has changed and adapted. It's still the same thing. Like for God's sakes, the other end of that is an alligator, but I really didn't want an alligator on me, so I got a dragonfly. And that's just like that's the state of perseverance, knowing that anything is get throughable. If a fucking dragonfly can do it, then why can't I? So there's there's the perseverance to get through life, and then the tonic solids and the electromagnetic color spectrum, which shows me on some level. Life is fundamentally perfect, and it doesn't matter how you want to slice the cake or shape the fucking pie. It's perfect. It's all geometry, and in any point in time where I don't think that there's some sort of structure to all of the all of the pain, all of the loss, all of the joy, all of the gain, all of the progress, I'm forced to look down as I'm writing or thinking or crying something, and I look and go, damn it, this is fundamentally what it is supposed to be. Perfect. It's, it's perfectly imperfect. Yes. Because you have the... And then that, that geometry, how the geometry is, the, the, the angles is the, the fr- uh, frequencies, the vibration. You have the hard angles and straight lines to the soft, the, the sphere, masculine to feminine. And so you have everything in between. It's literally all the other levels of correspondence, and polarity... Um, ment- mental, uh, mentality, mentalism, self-reflection, self-similarity, they're all there in on your arm. In that, that's like, the, it's not only the rainbow, the electromagnetic of light, it's of, of everything. Of everything that can be theorized, that can be I- idealized and seen, is covered by those shapes. And, uh, and I never thought of that before. Um, I thought about thinking about it, but I never got it that way, probably because we didn't go through the list like that. Um, and so, and in the same way as the flower of life pattern, when it's complete, that is the way to get fem- to have feminine beginnings and to end up with masculine lines, meaning the ma- male comes from the female, not the other way around, which is it's taught backwards. It's taught as a, ma- as a masculine male god when it might be more of the opposite, that it starts with the feminine essence, with the feminine uh, void, if you will. And so, and then uh, ignoring the gender is kind of like results in failing to to respect and and uh, feel that perfection in the difference between selves between halves like we're you know it, the other half of, of the gender and then one as a result might impose their gender on another and you know be masculine to a, the feminine essence the f- mean to a female any idea you can work that out in life or you know too hard on your body whatever that is you disconnect from nature you know, always around computers and electrical stuff and just squared lines and messes your, your head up because stuff like that. Or the, uh, you try to impose another gender on your own and you try to be a gender you're not. And you try and be, you accept it as, as something, something else. And so, and then we come to the last one, the last principle, which is care, which is kind of wrapped up by mind, heart, and gut. That when all these are applied and we do it with care, ultimately, I kind of feel like that's what they meant when you become a god, little g. Like, it, you literally can see everything from all angles. It's as if, well, let me say this. Like, I don't have time to explain. I, I think both of us don't have time, but uh, we can continue talking. But um, the the hidden mind of God is everywhere, but it is in no one place in particular. This hidden mind is that sacred geometry that can be and the principles that can be used to explain why everything is what it is and what it means in essence to everything else in the universe when you can form a language an equation a geometry or a drawing or whatever and pass that on through objective communication to another person you've made the hidden language the hidden mind the secret visible and known and you in that way can recreate that and you become the creator so that's how i'm going to wrap up 
my whole whole thing behind that. And then you know the care, you have the motive, the intention, the production of action. Without that care, everything, the whole every the whole nine yards, it goes to nothing. It's the dead body floating in the water. And uh, so you can add what you will and wrap it wrap that up. Is that a log? <laughs> log? Is that a corpse? I don't know. It's a guy that didn't have care. It's a dude who didn't care. <laughs> he didn't know how to swim. Yeah, he was, was looking for something deeper, like the man who swims out to the ocean with the tide. Exactly. The ocean of his mind. And he drowned. And the unconscious, you see. That works. <laughs> Waters are always unconscious. Always represent the the mystery, the hidden the hidden realm. Yeah. At least in my mind, I always think of that now. <laughs> this has been fruitful. Oh yeah. So, all right, people, I'll keep the call going. I'm gonna I'm gonna end the recording. I hope everybody enjoyed that. I'm gonna go through and line up times for all these explanations. I know I kind of drew it on, and along at the end there, maybe maybe somebody will find. Find benefit in that. If we pay attention to these things, all these charades, all this confusion, and then all the beautiful mystery between self and other self, and what is going on becomes revealed. It becomes unveiled. It becomes visible. The hidden becomes visible. So take a look. Have a gander. Have you know? Allow yourself to dream a bit. And open up that feeling, listen to your your heart, your mind, and your gut, connect them into one congruent pattern that is neither a perfect sphere or a perfect cube. It is some combination of spiraling cubes, spherical, toroidal, you know, structures. Basically, it's all things in existence, which we create an energetic structure by being here, present in this realm, which is the gift of God, basically, the gift of life. Do you have anything else you want to say before I close the recording? <clears throat> just to reiterate uh, always go with your instincts if you get if you come across something and you're just like you know I've got a really got a bad feeling about this have that bad feeling feel it, know it and act on it feel enough to know enough to do it that sounds good. All right, thank you. And say, thank you. Say your name that you want to be out there. Oh, my name is Spencer Eskridge, like an Eskimo Ridge. Like Eskridge. Eskridge. I have a YouTube channel, but it's not uh, it's not where I want it to be. But we're working on it. Well, it's a, it's a breathing and unraveling, so we'll we'll get there. Everyone will. Thank you for That's watching, awesome. and uh, we'll see you again. <laughs>